Hello again to all audience. Hi, Hi Dr. Fadiba. <laughs> Hi again to all audience. Do you hear me, Professor Khan? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, it's very clear okay. sound. I can hear you. Good. Thank you. Professor Khan, during this time, this during the, the, uh, sh this short break, many questions appeared in the chat box. Um, I can see, yes. Do you want to answer some of the questions? Um, I see some of the questions and I yeah. think I'm going to answer in the next session, in the next presentations. Okay. So maybe, let me see what I can answer now. I'm going to just scan and then see. Okay, uh, For so uh, dear audience, uh, the second presentation of Professor Khan will be done. And after that, the questions uh, in during the presentation might be answered, the question that you have. Is it right, Professor Khan? Say that again. Uh, um, because uh, some of these questions might be answered uh, in your uh, second lecture. Yes. And I if will answer some of them in the second lecture, yes. Yeah, as if the question, your question cannot be answered, then... They can you uh, answer, uh, ask. Yes. yes. Yeah. Then do we need to... Here's a question. Can I yeah. just say, do we need to submit the answers to the questions? Yeah. I've answered them on a sheet because this format is not edited editable yes of course you can do it the sheet the worksheet is for you yeah it's for yeah. you as a, as um, you can use it whenever i've no issues you can write in there but i'm going to go through different formats so yeah. maybe it doesn't have to follow that format that's on the worksheet anyway yeah okay so mm -hmm. we are waiting for the second lecture professor khan please yep we'll start now I'm just looking at the last question. Factors affecting dental extraction, anxiety, and fear in adult patients. How do I frame the research question for the scenario in a PICO format? Can kindly let me know. Um, I have a question regarding the certificate. I wrote the country of reason why. I don't know about that. Can PICO be used for other types of studies? What is the difference between RCT and clinical trial? Of course, we'll. I'm not doing epidemiology, but I can answer that question for you. To do a primary search, to change a primary question to a developed question, which can make it into a PICO, that's fine. That's quite all right. That's acceptable. You can do that. You can always state a question and you can refine it again even further. Sometimes we develop questions and then they're so broad. And once you start searching, you might realize that you need to refocus that question, but I think I will touch on some of those things. So can we start now, Dr. Pariba? Yes, yes, we are waiting for you. The question will be answered later. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Um, where did we jump? Okay, let me just go back to where we stopped. So we said we stopped and we said we are going to find a way to tackle clinical questions. We will convert it into a manageable, manageable, answerable format. I think I do pick up on that again. I spoke about two different types of questions, clinical questions and the research questions for research. So let's pick up where we left off and we said we're going to tackle it convert the question into a manageable, answerable format. And I've given you, it says PICO, PCOS, PCOT, or its variants. And there are different variants. Um, PICO, and I'll go through all what that means, rephrase the question, we'll develop a guide, how we can use the core concepts of the questions and how we can then effectively develop a search strategy in order to search for proper information and appropriate information. So the approach for clinical questions is you need to translate the uncertainty into answerable clinical questions, develop the ability to formulate precise, structured, answerable questions, and as, which has been identified as one of the key tasks for clinicians using this evidence-based approach. The questions need to be relevant to the identified problem. And they need to be constructed in such a way that they facilitate searching for a precise answer. So one of, and it's the original format. I've, I've, I've just included this. It is what is called the PICO method. The evidence-based practitioners, experts, 
have recommended the following steps in formulating a clinical question. But this is not the only clinical question. This is the original format of this question. And it has four basic components. It says P for patient or population, I for intervention, C for comparison or comparator, and O for outcomes. So this is the original format. Let me just put it onto our, oh my God, I'm talking to myself. Can you hear me? Are you able yes, to see? Yes, yes, Professor Khan, we can hear you. You can see the screen. <laughs> and the screen, yes. Okay, yes. you can. Okay, good. I thought for a moment you, I missed you. No, 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 both of them are clear. No, both of them are clear. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, let me just get back to where I stopped. So let's talk about the original format. The original format that the evidence-based healthcare professionals recommended was the PICO format. And of course, PICO, as you know, stands for patient intervention, comparator outcomes. And of course, today, there are many, many different other formats as well. But let's focus on PICO first. Some refer to it as PICO, and that was the original name. Some have now moved on and they called PICOS, they've called it PICOT. Um, and I'll refer to those different aspects. Firstly, P stands for patient problem population. Who does this question relate to? Who are the, who's the people involved? The intervention, it can be a therapy, can be a diagnostic test, or it can be any concern or issue. Comparison or comparator can be another intervention, another diagnostic test, placebo, or the standard care. For example, you look at the old form of treatment, and the intervention would be a new form of treatment, and you want to compare those two. The outcomes, here you must clearly specify what is it that you are interested in. Are you interested in, in improvement in quality of life? Are you, are you interested in a change in function of a patient? Are you interested in reduction of pain? What is it that you want to know? So that's the outcomes. These outcomes can also be classified into what is called primary outcomes, and secondary outcomes. For example, I did a randomized control trial on patients with a shortened dental arch and different forms of shortened arches. And I said, some of them will have a denture and I will replace it up to the sevens, the teeth, and others, I will keep it as a shortened arch and I compared the two. Standard treatment was replacing all missing teeth. And that means making a denture for a patient. The new treatment says, or at least according to my, my PhD that I, that I worked on, said that patients can function satisfactorily between less than, between 10, 20 teeth. 20 teeth and uh, less, let's say. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of it. There are different variations to the shortened arch. So let's say it's a shortened arch versus somebody who has or had all their teeth replaced. So those two you then compare. So that would be your comparator. When I looked at the outcomes of it, I wanted to know whether patients can function with it. I wanted to know whether patients are satisfied with it. So this patient satisfaction. So those would be your primary outcomes. Secondary outcomes would be things like, did the patient lose any teeth with either one of the two treatments? So did they have to have any extractions with the denture, those who had the denture and those who didn't have the denture? Um, did they lose, did they, did they have any periodontal complaints? That would be a secondary outcome. So it's not your most important outcome, but it's also outcomes that you can then establish once you go back and, and, and do an evaluation of these patients. If somebody asked in the chat earlier, is it the setting? No, it's the study design. S stands for study design and T stands for time. So you can decide on your study design that answers your clinical question the best. So for example, if it's a study on based on effectiveness or an intervention, of course a randomized controlled trial would be the best design. And time of course could be over time, over a period of time. You can say you're going to do this kind of research, et cetera, on these patients. You're going to compare these two interventions over this period of time. So that's where time comes in. So that's, and these are not the only variations, by the way. This is just the basic variation. 
let's talk first about uh, before I go to the the tips, phrasing your questions and building this question. Um, somebody asked in the chat, what's the difference between an RCT and a clinical trial? A clinical trial can be any clinical study. There does not, they, you can have comparisons. I think it's about how you accept people into your clinical study. Now, randomized control trial has a specific methodology, has a specific um, phase in it. It speaks about um, accepting people, randomizing people into your study and then randomizing them into the treatment, into the intervention or into the comparison or the standard care. So those are specific methodologies. I don't want to add too much to it, but when you randomize people into a study, it could be, for example, um, we do block randomization, or we say every alternate person, or we say every fifth person will go into this group and every fifth, next five people will go into the next group, et cetera. Randomization has a clear methodology. So if you want to know about what or how randomized controlled trials work, read up about that. A clinical trial is just any clinical study. Any clinical study that where it's not necessarily, they've not been randomized into the study. Of course, the gold standard for any research would be a randomized control trial because what you do when you're very specific about that design is that you eliminate any biases. So that's very important in clinical research. So let's get back to the, the order or the, or the um, work of the day is phrasing clear questions. Tips for building your questions. We spoke about PICO. And if I just stick to PICO for a few, for the, for a few uh, minutes, we speak about the patient. You need to identify um, who the patient is. How do you describe this group that you are so interested in? That's where you speak about your patient or your problem. Okay. The intervention I said earlier on could be a new intervention. Which main intervention am I considering? Okay. The comparison could be also another intervention or it could be the standard care that the patients are normally exposed to. So you want to move on from the standard care and to introduce a new intervention. So you're comparing the two. The outcomes is what can I hope to accomplish? What could this exposure really affect? How will it change things for us? That's your outcomes, okay? I've included this table in your, um, in one of the worksheets. So you can always use them in future. Let's get to an example for ex just to make things a little bit closer to home for you. Here we have a patient and he's, it's, his name is Roger. He's a 26 year old student. He's been diagnosed with major depression. He has had three different antidepressant medications in the past with no improvement. He's reluctant to try a further prescribed medication and he asks about non-pharmacologic alternatives. You've heard that repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation has been trialed for treatment, resistant depression, but you're not sure if its effectiveness has been proven. You tell Roger, you will look into this for him and get back to him. Now this attitude or this approach that you've adopted is what we call an evidence-based healthcare approach. You get to find out what the evidence says about it. If I move on, just to look at PICO and what PICO says, in terms of that clinical scenario. Now we spoke earlier on about um, phrasing your question. So you turn it into a clinical, you're turning your clinical scenario into a PICO or PICOS. Now we've had the clinical scenario. We know it's a patient with treatment resistant, non-psychotic depression. The intervention is the new thing that you're looking at is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the comparison would be other treatments other than the intervention, no transcranial magnetic stimulation. Okay, the outcomes is very clear. You want to have a reduction in depression severity, or you want to have put the patient into remission. So that's how you take a clinical scenario and you change it into a PICO. Okay, study designs. Of course, you're looking at you're looking at a comparison. You're looking at an intervention, a new a new treatment and you're comparing to other form. And of course, the standard 
the, the most appropriate design in this case would be an RCT, or you look at the information found in a systematic review of RCTs. So this is how you take a clinical scenario into a PICO. That's step one. Step two, you can take that PICO and formulate it into a proper question. Okay, so let's see. In patients with treatment resistant, non-psychotic depression, is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation beneficial in reducing depression severity and affecting transmission? Now I want you to see how that was changed from the question into this. Someone asked earlier in the chat about that. See what you can do with your question that you now have. Okay, I don't remember exactly what the question was, but I know there's a question. So see how you can change it using that format. Next, we say create a logic grid for the question or create a guide for the question. What you do with this guide is firstly, you have to identify the concepts in your question which need to be searched for your search to have minimum level of precision. So you need to look at the concepts that are most important in your question. Secondly, you clarify which concepts can be left out of the search because you don't also want to add too much information in your question. And lastly, can you find appropriate and useful synonyms acronyms, variants in spelling for each of those concepts that you've identified. Just focusing back on that same patient, let's look at concept one. We speak about a patient that has treatment resistant depression, the patient, we speak about treatment resistant depression. And so treatment resistant depression, that's the first concept you've looked at, and it can be, and can be written in different ways. Some people are referred to as treatment resistant depression. Some will refer to it as treatment resistant depressive disorder. Some will refer to it as treatment resistant major depressive disorder. Some will write it using an acronym and say treatment resistant MDD, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you will then develop a grid or a guideline. So if you're going to search, you actually have to include all of these terms so that you can pick up all the information that's needed. So what this grid does is it helps you, helps you find synonyms for those words. And I'll tell you how we can use that a little later on. If you look at the second concept, this is the new intervention. It speaks about repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation can also be referred to as deep repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or DTMS or RTMS. So it's just the way it's described, the concept. If I look at, um, I can use exactly the same uh, 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 idea here and say, for example, I want to see all RCTs, um, all yeah, um, studies that have looked at RCTs only. Now, RCTs can also be described in different ways. It can be called an RCT. Some people refer to it as a clinical trial. Some people refer to it as a prospective study. So those are the, are the synonyms you would use for your study design. That's another aspect that you can look at. Now, here's a grid I have for you, okay? It, it mostly focuses on PCOT, PICO but it has, does have some variation depending on the type of clinical question or research question we are asking. And if I'm going to tell you now, this is the grid that you're going to use often. So keep it with you. It's a good guide and I will go through it with you. For example, for an effectiveness study or intervention treatment. In patients, what is the effect of the intervention on the outcomes compared to or compared with um, the comparison within this or within this time period, etc. So you can phrase it whichever way you want to. Now look at the question that I've asked you to look for and see where you can fit it in. What kind of question are you asking? Are you, are you asking etiology question? Do you want to know the etiology of things? Are patients who have this condition at increase or decrease risk of the outcomes compared with 
other patients with or without those conditions over this time period. So you can phrase it whichever way you want to. I hope this grid will be of help to you. On the far right of this grid, we also look at this type of study designs that can answer your question. I spoke to you about the different clinical questions earlier on. Here is just a framework to phrase those questions, the approach of it. Of course, it's not set in stone. There can be variations as well, okay? So if there are any questions related to this, we can speak a little later. Next, we're going to look at the design to answer your question. And I've already referred to some of this in the previous slide, where I said your therapy question, you look at RCTs. Your etiology question, you can also look at RCTs or cohort studies. Your prevention question also looks at RCTs. But I think, as I also said earlier on, the the design that answers most types of questions would be a systematic review of especially RCTs of all available studies is better than an individual study. Okay, remember systematic reviews provide the most valid evidence base to inform the development of trustworthy guidelines and recommendations and for clinical decision making. So it is, it has become, if you remember the evidence pyramid I showed you earlier on, they form the apex of this pyramid. So they have become the most reliable evidence that one can get for any, any kind of research. I found this while searching and, and, and reading around what I wanted to present today. Someone has developed, it's called Ferugia, developed two frameworks for refining research questions. You, you know the PCOT one, and I've referred to the PCOT one earlier on, but someone has defined one called the finer criteria for good research question. What must be in a good research question? What are the criteria for a good research question? First, it must be feasible. Do you have adequate number of subjects, adequate expertise, affordable in time and money, manageable in scope as well? It must be interesting. It must get the answers that getting the answer intrigues the investigator or the community. It must be novel, um, must be ethical, of course, and it must be relevant. I think for me, relevant is very important to the scientific knowledge, the clinical and health policy, and to future research. So people have developed different kinds of frameworks as well. So yes, there are other frameworks available. And you know, the world of evidence-based healthcare has expanded so much um, so don't think whatever we've given you here is everything. It's not. So we move on. And the next step would be to take all those terms that you've developed, whether it's those synonyms, whether it is the acronyms, etc., and use that in your search. And that step is what we call development of a search strategy. And I think my next colleague will probably focus on that because they're going to speak about different databases and where you search and probably what you search with. But it starts with the research question. It starts with your PICO. So you've had different synonyms. So for example, population, you describe your population and you can have different terms to describe your population. And in your strategy that you want to use to search for specific literature or evidence, you can use those different terms in there and you join them what, by what is called or, or, and these are your mesh terms. And I'm not going to go into that because I think whoever does databases can then speak to you about those mesh terms and um, Boolean operators, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole world all on its own. And there are so many things that you can learn, but I will give you some examples of those. Then of course, this PICO terms, you will then join all of those and we then have what is called the search strategy. Here's an example of a search strategy. I'm busy doing some review with a colleague of mine and it's based on community-based workers. Community-based workers are also described in the literature as community health workers, or they're described as health care workers or primary health care workers. So I put all those terms together because they refer to the same individuals or the same group of people and I will connect it with an or. But in that search strategy, we don't just look at that. Remember, this is, would be our P. So the first part is our P. Then our I or intervention would be, for example, oral health 
maternal health, neonate, all the different um, areas of health care that these community workers work in. So that would be your I. Your comparator would be the services or the context. In our case, it wasn't comparator, it was context. So we look at the different areas of where they're working. And then we had your outcomes. What did they do? Increase access to services, lifestyle changes, increase in knowledge, increase in skills. That's our outcomes. So we connect all the aspects of that PICO question by and. And then you can also add the study designs to it. So the next one is clinical trials, qualitative research, reviews, systematic reviews, all the different types of designs I want to include, I've included in here. These are what is I referred to earlier on as your search filters. So this will filter all the different types of research. By the way, this strategy is for what is called a scoping review. And with a scoping review, you look at different types of study designs. That's why you have different types of study designs included in the last part. Just an example, I do have other strategies, which I didn't share at this point. But just to give you an example, how we move from PICO, the different aspects, you go to your um, question and you go to your grid with the synonyms and acronyms and the different variants of the same condition or concept. And you then develop a search strategy, which you will use to search for literature. And that's very important. Now you have research and clinical questions, and we spoke about this earlier on, but now also you must remember people do different kinds of research. You get primary research and you get secondary research. Primary research would be your randomized control trials, your clinical trials, your cross-sectional studies, cohort studies, your case studies, etc. That's primary research. But you also get secondary research would be your review types. And I'm gonna give you a list of reviews that you can do. But you get reviews, different review stuff. And the most classic of all reviews is a systematic review. This is the pillar of all evidence-based healthcare. Traditionally, systematic reviews used to, they used to assess the effectiveness of health interventions by critically examining and summarizing the results of RCTs only. But of course, systematic reviews have evolved over the years. Today, you can do a systematic review of only qualitative research, even in education, people can do it. So you can do different kinds of research, different kinds of systematic reviews. Um, of course, we said the most effective or the most common one was the effectiveness one. And because these systematic reviews have evolved over the years, the criteria to do these have also changed and has become more rigorous. But I think the fundamental issues primarily relate to the type of questions that's being asked and be the type of evidence used to answer those questions. So there are, of course, different types of reviews at this stage that I want you to know about and that you must acknowledge. So in terms of systematic reviews, the question is, and somebody has already referred to that earlier on in the chat where we said, can we force all clinical questions or research questions into the PICO format? Of course not. It's really impossible. And so you get different formats for it. We know what a systematic review is and how robust that kind of research is. But there are other different types of reviews and synthesis research as well. And if you just look at this list, um, a systematic review, of course, can end up just being a narrative synthesis or it can include a meta-analysis. But you get things like, a variation to the systematic review would be what is called the rapid review. It is it has all the, the 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 steps of a systematic review, but it is not as rigorous or as extensive as a systematic review. But it is almost like a systematic review. Then you have one that I'm pretty familiar with at this stage is called a scope a scoping review. I've done a few of these and I tend to force my students also to do it, but there are certain criteria set for these, but you also set research questions for these. And of course, then there are other types as well, and I'm not going to go into this, but this is what you call synthesis research or secondary research. It is based on primary research that has been done already. 
So let's focus on different formats that you get for systematic review type questions. So the most common one we said was the effectiveness systematic review. And here you can use the PICO format, but of course there can be a variation to that as well. So you get different types of systematic reviews, as I mentioned to you earlier on. Some of those would be qualitative reviews and they answer most of your why questions. And of course you can't force it into a PICO. So you can have a focus on population, but you can have what is called phenomena of interest or your context. You can change that. If you look at costs or, or economic evaluation, you can change that PICO into what is called PCOC, for example, population intervention, comparator outcome and context. The prevalence studies or prevalence systematic reviews or incident systematic reviews can look at cocoa pop condition, context and population. So your question format changes according to the needs of your research and what it is that you want. Okay, so there's a reference for you at the bottom if you want to read more about these. I think I'm just mentioning a few more comments on this, but there are variations to these as well. Again, I said the effectiveness systematic review is your most common type and it assesses the effectiveness of an intervention with one another. And here again, you need to establish a specific focused question that can be utilized to define search terms, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now, the, nowadays, it's possible that almost any type of question can be subjected to the process of a systematic review. Okay, it depends what you want to do. Um, it should be, I think the research question, what it does for you is it provides operational framework for your, for your review, whichever type of review you're going to do. I think when you do a systematic review, you also need to look at, you need to have a critical eye when assisting publications identified. And I'm saying this because we spoke earlier on about clinical questions. And clinical questions, and I said to you, the most um, valid evidence would be from a systematic review. But at this point, I want to throw in a little spanner in the wheel here with you and say to you, be very critical when you look at at, at evidence that says to you it's a systematic review because not all systematic reviews are following the strict criteria for systematic review. Researchers would like to do this kind of novel research and so they've all become involved in conducting systematic reviews. But if you critically appraise those or you critically analyze those systematic reviews, many of them have a lot of faults in it as well. So be careful when you when you say, oh, I found this evidence from a systematic review. Be careful that you know what you're looking at and what you're reading. Okay, so my next set would be Dr. Fariba, another break, where I'm going to do some examples. And maybe I think at this point, it would be good to look at some of the questions people might have, or give people a bit of space to even use those worksheets now that I've given them some kind of format, um, if there are any new questions. Um, uh, yeah. Professor, I really, it was, your presentation was really, really useful and informative. Uh, do you want to, do you want to have a look at the questions? If, if anybody, if anybody has the questions that the question has not been answered. Yes, uh, yeah. Here's one at the bottom. It yeah, says, I can write the question again. again. Yeah. Yes. And they can ask, ask, let them ask oh, questions. Yeah. That would be the better way. All I right. guess the outcome does not necessarily have to be a negative outcome. No, it doesn't have to be a negative outcome. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative outcome. I agree with you on that one. Um, it can be good. It can add, it can add more to your research than it just being a negative outcome. Um, in the first worksheet, um, I think the S stands for, if it stands for setting, it's fine, but you can change it accordingly to the way you want it, as long as you're specific about what it is. Um, let me just have a quick look at those sheets that I sent to you. Um, type of question, type of study design. It speaks about study design. So I would assume it is S for study design. 
T is for time. T is mostly for time. I think the S here would be study design because it speaks about study design. Pico format, type of question. Um, and then it says identify the type of study and it gives you different study designs at the bottom. So I assume it speaks about study design. Um, the next question says about databases. In systematic reviews, we see different numbers and types of them. Would you please, whichever is better to be searched and what is the minimum? Oh, that is that is a loaded question. <laughs> that is a loaded question. Um, you know, when you when you look at databases, they are oh, they are like a nightmare. I can use one strategy today, and I can use and I can search for for articles. And tomorrow, I can use exactly the same strategy, and I will get a different set of articles or different numbers of articles. So these things have a mood of their own. So unfortunately, yes. And but of course, you, you need to be very specific. You also need to know where to search. You can't look for clinical research under qualitative databases. And that's very important. So I think the next presentation for the next day, Dr. Fariba, would be on databases. So they can maybe highlight to you what kind of databases are for which studies. Um, they will probably focus and talk to you about gray literature. Where do you find gray literature, those databases? Um, those kinds of things. So they can speak to you about that minimum. Sometimes, I think it depends on your question. I'm, I'm doing some uh, research with some of my postgrad students and even colleagues as well. And you know, on some days we get thousands of papers. And if you then sort of go through those thousands of papers and in order to avoid that kind of time wastage, you have to be specific with your questions. So I'm talking about the research question and I can't tell you how important it is to be specific about your research question, to be very focused, because that will change those numbers drastically. Um, yes, of course, you know, you can have thousands of papers on a topic, but you don't want to get thousands when you search. And then once you have gone through each one of those, and there's a three step process that you do that. For example, you look at the titles and you say, oh my goodness, this is focusing on a topic that's totally out of mind. So what happens in those databases is, for example, if you use the word healthcare, mm -hmm. you use the word healthcare and the word healthcare is picked up for everything and every little article that has the word healthcare in it. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. You want the database to be very specific about what you want. Um, I'm doing a study with a, with a colleague of mine and she's doing it on um, oral health promotion interventions. And you have no idea how it picks up the word intervention and it gives us studies that we don't want to include at all. So it's very difficult because certain databases do that. Others on the other hand don't. So for example, with the same strategy, you get with one, one database, you'll get thousands of papers, but with another one, you'll get hundreds. So there are big differences in those numbers. So it's never, you can never really put a number down and say, you know what, this is the minimum you should have, this is not. I think the whole idea is to focus your question. Make your question very focused when you do it. What appraisal tools do we utilize? I don't want to crash in on someone else's um, topic. I think someone is going to do critical appraisal and I see it's a very extensive schedule. So I think when you, when you sit in that presentation, they will speak to you about appraisal tools. Um, there are lots, different, different groups develop different appraisal tools. I have found two that, that, that work really well and they have different appraisal tools for different studies. For example, the evidence-based healthcare group, the evidence-based medicine group, they have tools, but also um, the Australian-based group called the Joanna Briggs Institute they also have lots of appraisal tools. So I always refer people to those. Um, so those are just broad areas, but I'm sure whoever's going to do appraisal tools with you will do that with you. Um, the next question for doing a systematic review on RCT studies must be considered or, or other studies like case control cohort and can also be included. Okay, now you know, they say the most the most classic systematic review is one where you only look at RCTs, okay? Luckily, I've done one of those. 
But you know what? The world is not only about RCTs. We love to do RCTs. And let me tell you, once you've done one, it's a good space to be in for yourself as a researcher. And I've, I've, I've been fortunate again. I've done an RCT, okay? It's a beautiful study design. I think it has the structure that's, that's it's well laid out. So yes, doing a systematic review with only RCTs is the classic. It's the, it's the best thing to do. But unfortunately, people do a lot of other studies. I'm currently busy doing a systematic review with a colleague. We have studies that were lab-based studies. It's on nanoparticles. And <laughs> I said to my friend, you know what? Take your nanoparticles and go. I don't want to do that kind of research. I don't do lab studies. I want to do clinical research. But you know what? That's just the nature of research. You get all kinds of research. So yes, you can. You can do a systematic review with different types of study designs. So you do have that. What you need to do is you need to know how to appraise each one of those. Mm -hmm. So when you're going to include different study designs, you get different appraisal tools for different types of study designs. Um, RCTs will have specific ones. And I am a, I don't want to promote, but of course I can promote. I, I follow the uh, Cochrane collaboration groups. So I follow their systematic review guidelines. Um, so if you go into the Cochrane database, you'll see all the systematic reviews and they are very comprehensive. But your everyday journals don't want to accept those systematic reviews because they're so extensive. So you don't have to follow that format. But you need to follow a format. You can't say you're going to do a systematic review and you don't do appraisal of it. You can't say and call it a systematic review if you have not followed those steps. Of it. You at least need to follow the basic steps of a systematic review. When you're going to include different study designs, yes, you do get tools for case control studies. You do get appraisal tools for cohort studies. And you have to then include all of those. Even for the lab systematic review, the, the, the systematic review on lab studies I'm currently busy with, there is an appraisal. We are, we have found an appraisal tool for it. So we're going to include that because that gives us, um, that will make our systematic review more reliable, more valid, and we want, and, and more credible. And that's what we want at the end of the day as a researcher. You want to publish credible research. So that's where we are. I hope I've answered those questions. Um, what are your questions? May I ask my questions? Of course you may. Of course you may. Uh, I hope I can answer you, though. <laughs> As you kindly explained, uh, RCT is the best type of uh, research. But yes. uh, unfortunately, it's not easy to be done. Um, no, it's not, no. especially with COVID. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But uh, not considering the COVID, uh, but I tried to do several times with the RCT, but it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to say, but performing and designing and performing the study is really difficult to be done. Yeah. And, uh, and about the question I have, synthesis is research that you explain about it. You explained, as I remember, you explained that everything cannot be performed in a systematic review. Is it right? Any question? Just repeat that again. Do I About understand you right? Synthesis, is, synthesis is re research, is it right? Yes. Synthesis uh, research, yes. Yes. Uh, I think uh, you, you um, explained that all the questions might not be answered and might not be done as a systematic review. You so hit. you recommend synthesis uh, research, is it right? Okay, let me let me let me get back. The classic type of synthesis research is I a systematic review. Yeah, yeah. Would you the classic, that? the classic type of re synthesis research is a systematic review. Uh -huh. But that type of synthesis research has evolved. So now you get different types of synthesis research. So you get different types of reviews. And when I say reviews, and yes, somebody has just posed a question, Dr. Kumar has posed, what is a scoping review? And so I'm going to hopefully answer him yeah. as well as I speak about the different types of synthesis research. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, when we used to get literature reviews, 
they were very unstructured. People used to, for example, you have your area of interest, you search the literature, you take all the articles that you think are of interest to you, and you include that and you call that a literature review and we used to publish that. When mm -hmm. I say in the past, I mean 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, you'll still find some of those. But we've now discovered and we've learned with a systematic review that you need to adopt a structured approach mm -hmm. so that you don't exclude any research or any studies. For example, now you say, okay, this is my area of interest. This is my broad area of research. I want to do synthesis research, whatever type of review, and I'm going to develop a research question for that. And then I'm going to search. So you follow these steps of evidence-based healthcare, this evidence-based approach, and you search different databases and you will find those articles. For example, if you do a systematic review, the minimum number of databases to be included is two. Now, as a researcher, I still think that's too little. I will say include more databases. So what you then do is you search all those databases using the criteria that you got from your research question, you developed it into a search strategy, and you will find articles. Now, already, just by doing that, you have developed an objective approach to the literature you find. Mm -hmm. So now you can then analyze that information in a structured way. So that is synthesis, synthesis research. That mm -hmm. is what the review is about. A scoping review, now systematic review is clear. It can be any kind of clinical question, and it can be you can have systematic review with only RCTs. You can have systematic review with only qualitative research. You can have a systematic review with mixed type of designs. So that's a systematic review. A scoping review on the other hand is a type of synthesis research where you look at a topic that's very really novel. You don't have, you want to know for instance um, how much, what kind of research can I do related to nanoparticles, for instance? But nanoparticles is not so, it's not so common. People haven't done so much on it. So I want to see what research has been done related to nanoparticles. Nanoparticles in any kind of sphere, whether it's composites or anything else, right? I'm just talking broadly. So you, you say, okay, my broad area is nanoparticles. I want to see what kind of research has been done related to nanoparticles. Then a scoping review could be a type of review you can do. You will look at, for example, you'll develop your research question, you will um, have criteria, you'll develop your strategy, you'll do search data, different databases, and you'll get all the articles related to nanoparticles. And you will say, okay, so I'm going to um, look at what kind of lab research was done with nanoparticles, what kind of clinical research was done with nanoparticles, what kind of synthesis research was done. Did anybody do systematic reviews on nanoparticles? So you first look at the designs, mm -hmm. then you're going to go further. And whilst doing this, you are appraising those papers. You haven't even used a tool yet to appraise, but you are already appraising, you are reading into those papers and seeing what research has been done. And then you say, okay, my interest is to do clinical research on nanoparticles. They've only done one cross-sectional study. Let me see if I can do an RCT. No one has done an RCT on nanoparticles. So that's what a scoping review does. It actually helps you, it guides you to identify research gaps. So that's what a scoping review can do. Thank I you. hope that answers your question, Dr. Kumar. Yeah. Can you awesome. summarize the last question about systematic reviews and other studies? The last question. Um, can you just, which other question are we talking about now? Which last question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know where we are. Question. The last question was a scoping review that you clearly defined it and what is the okay. main and uh, he or I think I answered. Did I answer? Um, would, I can't say the name. Sorry. Yeah. My yeah. apologies for that. I hope I answered. If I didn't, please rephrase. Then I can answer. Any other questions? Apparently, you answered all the questions that has been written. 
Okay, we did, good. We did one by one. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, can we go for the uh, the next section, lecture, next lecture? Yes, we can. I think my next section is just literally on um, examples, examples of research questions, okay. which you can use, which the delegates can use. They can look at it. Um, they can, if they don't have their own question, they can try and put it into those worksheets I've given and yeah. ask questions related to that. So it's can you hear me now still? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at examples of clinical questions. Again, as I said to you, this framework is very helpful. I use it, I use it all the time. I give it to all my postgrad students and to my colleagues to use as well. So it's a good tool to use. So that's my suggestion to you. Keep it at hand and see if you can frame. Let's get back to the question that we had originally as part of the presentation about the young lady that's off to college and her mom is worried that she's going to have ortho relapse due to her wisdom teeth. Okay. So the question is, what do you think, doctor? She's never had any problems with her wisdom teeth. Should she have her wisdom teeth taken out before she leaves for college? I heard they can cause the teeth to crowd and she just got her braces off. So let's develop a PICO for that. Let's create a PICO, right? Remember we said PICO? We said patient intervention, comparison and outcome. If you look at the patient, it's your adolescent girl, good oral health, good oral hygiene, impacted, asymptomatic, third molars with no evidence of pathology. Now this P is described extensively. It's very comprehensively described. We don't always have to take everything into that question. Your intervention would be, you could have her wisdom teeth surgically extracted. Comparison would be to leave the wisdom teeth where they are, monitor, wait, and observe. And the outcomes is to see whether there's going to be ortho relapse, surgical complications, other issues. Now, in this case, if you look at outcomes, your primary outcome would be ortho relapse. Surgical complications could be a secondary outcome or any other, compl any other complaints you might have. So you will then form that into your question using that format. That's one example of a clinical case that we have. Here's a question that I have developed for, this uh, is for RCT. Yes, uh, sorry, I uh, interrupt you. Uh, would you please share your screen? Because oh, the did, I not, did, I not, did I not share the screen? No, no. Oh, sorry. I thought it was, it went straight to that. Okay. Let me go back. Yeah, please. Um, please. Let me share the, the, the worksheet that you have at the same time you read the scenario uh, the audience can understand okay. it better. Yeah, sorry, I didn't share the screen. No, but let me go back. I spoke. I only spoke. Yeah, you just speak, and uh, so I think the audience could not understand it properly. Okay. So yeah, this is the. Yeah, this is. Are we Are we okay now? Yeah. Would you Would you please repeat from the first because some audience could not understand it properly. Yeah. If it's possible no, this, for you. This is, this is the first slide. Yeah. So we're going to do examples of clinical cases. So this is a framework I said you must try and keep at hand. Yeah. It is just ways of phrasing your clinical or your research question. It's a good guide. It can help you. Um, so you can look at these and use this as a guide. So the first question, uh, first case I looked at was the one I referred to earlier on in the presentation about the young lady who goes to university and she's had a, her ortho treatment completed but she's now got her wisdom teeth coming out. And her mom is worried about the impact of the wisdom teeth on her current setup. So of course we use the PICO, patient intervention, comparison and outcome. And that's what we're going to use in her case because we speak about the patient, adolescent young lady, good overall health, good oral hygiene, impacted asymptomatic third molars with no evidence of pathology. And of course, like I said earlier on, it is a comprehensive description of your patient, but you don't have to always put all of that information in the question. You can just take the most important aspect out. Intervention would be, should she have her wisdom teeth extracted? That's surgical extraction, of course. 
comparison would be not to have those wisdom teeth extract, monitor those and wait and see what happens to her current setup, what happens to a teeth that has just had orthodontic treatment. And the outcomes, of course, would be is there going to be ortho relapse with the um, wisdom teeth present? And that would be your primary outcomes. You're most worried about, she's most worried about ortho relapse. Okay. Secondary outcome could be your surgical complications. Because if you're going to have surgical extractions, there could be complications with that. So you can then even comment on that or any other related conditions. That's case one. Okay, just an example of a case where you have it in its PICO format and you can work that into. And of course, like this would be an effectiveness, um, uh, uh, effectiveness um, question. So you would put it classically into that PICO format using the framework I've given you earlier on. Here's a question as well that I've done. This is one of this is the RCT that I've done. And the question was in partially dented adult patients. What is the effect of not replacing all posterior teeth, missing posterior teeth on daily functional needs and quality of life? That is your outcomes. Are we okay? You can still hear and see me? Yes, Dr. Khan, you have your uh, video. Okay, good. Compared with replacing all missing teeth with R RPDs over time. Okay, so that was the research question for my randomized control trial. Next, now what happened? Okay, that's example two. Okay, example three. Here's a question for you, and you can see if you can answer it and see if you can put it into that classic format. We have a diabetic patient that presents to your clinic requesting a scaling and polish as she was experiencing some pain on her lower gums. On intraoral examination, she presented with signs and symptoms of ANUG, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. You decided to prescribe metronidazole for five days and informed her that you would complete a scaling and polishing once this infection has resolved. She then speaks to you and she says to you, she wants to know if you can't just give her the new mouthwash her husband told her about. So here you have your patient, diabetic, that's your P, your, the outcomes, you want to have resolution of the ANUG, you have your normal standard treatment, which is your metronidazole, and you have your new intervention, the new mouthwash. So you can fit that also into your PICO. Example four would be patients with a severely resorbed lower lid generally experience pain under the lower dentures. You wonder whether the application of a rubber base to the inner surface will reduce the pain experienced by these patients. So you can put that into that format as well. Okay. Last example here, just to take you out of uh, dentistry, for example, a patient, a smoker of more than 30 years has come to you asking about something unrelated. You ask him if he's interested in stopping smoking. He tells you he's tried to quit smoking unsuccessfully in the past. A friend of, a friend of his have used, have successfully quit with acupuncture, however, should he try it? Other interventions you know about are nicotine replacement therapy and antidepressants. So you can take any clinical scenario and put that into your format and search for the most appropriate literature. Okay, here's a few examples of review research questions. Um, here's one I'm currently busy with, and we've tried to put it, it's not necessarily your classic PICO because the C is not your comparator, but it's the context that we're busy working in. And the question we said was, how successful are programs delivered by community-based workers in improving health outcomes in community settings? And here your population would be your community-based workers. The I or your intervention is your program. Any kind of healthcare program that the, the community-based workers are involved in. And the context, of course, is healthcare sector. The outcomes, increase access to services, lifestyle changes, et cetera, et cetera. So you can list your outcomes, whichever outcomes you want, okay? That are most appropriate 
to answer your question. So there's another format for you. Here's a few more questions. I'm busy with a digital workflows review, just to identify the research using a partial or complete digital workflow. So you can imagine that question can be transformed and written very differently because it focuses on two big areas of, of um, digital workflow, partial or complete. Then we have another one. What are the oral health behavior change interventions that are effective in improving oral health behaviors in eight to 18 year old children using during oral health promotion? And let me tell you with this review, gosh, it was such a, it was a pain to search certain databases because they were giving you thousands of unrelated, um, as I said to you earlier on, unrelated articles. Um, 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 for this review, so it was difficult to search. So some of them are not that easy if you if if you if you know what I'm talking about. Here's one very closely related to the space we are in, and I did this review with um, colleagues of mine in my department about the infection control and transmission measures that can be identified and inhibit the spread of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 in a dental setting. And the unfortunate part with doing reviews in, um, and this is a scoping review, of course, because there's not a lot, lot of primary research. Um, re primary research is only coming out now. From the time we submitted this review to the journal to the time the reviewer sent me comments, there were, I could have updated the search um, because there was primary research at that point. But initially when we did the search, there was nothing that we could find because, you know, as you know, COVID was something that none of us were faced with in the past. So yes, um, that's where you want to classically do a scoping review. Um, here I have one, the nanoparticle systematic review that I'm busy with. Does silver nanoparticles inhibit the growth of candida albicans in dentures and denture liners? And then we established a um, PICO for that one. And this is what you would call your effectiveness systematic review. Okay, so there's another example that you could use. Um, in another one that I've used, I think this was the question, the effectiveness systematic review that I've conducted and it's been published many, a few years ago already to identify and analyze clinical trials which could compare functional outcomes of prostodontic interventions used for treating shortened arches versus unrestored shortened arches in partially dented adult patients. So this question, we also classically use the PICO format. Um, yeah. And of course I included the S for the study designs. So here you classically have your clinical trials that are included because I only wanted to use, I wanted, I use the word clinical trial here, not randomized because then it would have excluded the non-randomized clinical trials. So I included randomized and non-randomized clinical trials in this question. Doctor, uh, Professor Khan, yes. I have a question now. Ask please, please ask. Uh, sorry, thank you. It is not my question. It is, uh, this question is from one of our lecture for the next uh, sessions uh, yes. from Professor uh, Ahmad Reza Shamshiri. Uh, uh, in the start of your uh, lecture, this question was, was written, and now I read it because it's related to the PICOs. Um, yes. Professor Shamshiri asked that in the wor first worksheet regarding PICOs, is some references, S stand for setting, example in clinic or I in did. hospital. Dr. Fariba, right? Dr. Fariba, I answered that question earlier on. Okay. I answered it. I did, okay. yes, I did. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I That's did, I went back to the worksheet and I can I can do so again after we've completed here. Then I'll do so again to show that the S um, is for study designs because on that worksheet, it was specifically for study designs. Okay. They didn't speak about um, settings. Thank and you. the settings uh, would refer to the context. No, so it would be if you look at the, the systematic review questions and once you've looked at this um, presentation again, you'll see the systematic review questions speak about context, not settings. OK, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. No yeah, no, it's OK. Then um, here's one. 
Oh, yes, 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 here's a research question. I did what is called a overview of systematic reviews as well, and it's published as well, um, where it also has a particular methodology. It's also synthesis research, but what I was looking at is only systematic reviews related to a particular topic. And then I synthesize that. And the reason you do that kind of research is to strengthen the evidence for any kind of review. For example, you have your evidence, your primary research, then you do a systematic review and you say, you've now looked at all the primary research related to that topic and you've synthesized all of that. And so it can either strengthen the evidence for that topic. And so you can do that. So you do a systematic review, but then you can do on top of that research, I almost, um, my colleagues laugh when I say, I say that is the third step in doing synthesis research, um, but it's just secondary research, don't worry. So it is looking at systematic reviews and strengthening the evidence related to a particular topic. So what I've done here is I've looked at all the different types of, all the different systematic reviews related to shortened arches and I've combined that. And that also then speaks to strengthening the evidence. Another type of review that does that would be what is called an umbrella, umbrella review. It also does that, strengthens the evidence related to it. So you bring together other reviews and you say how strong the evidence is related to something. And my topic, of course, was the shortened arch. So I wanted to see the strength of the evidence for the shortened arch and how it can change practice. And that's why that was important to do. So this is what uh, the question for a systematic review, for at least for an overview of systematic reviews. So when I say the study designs, I speak about high quality systematic reviews related to the SDA concept and its variants. And I looked at function and oral health quality of life. So that's where we are. Any questions, comments, clarifications, anything else you want me to do? Um, we'll speak about that. Lastly, anybody wants any information from me, that's my email address for you. You're most welcome to contact me. Thank you, Professor Khan. Would you please answer, uh, according to the last explanation, somebody yes. asked about Kumar. Asked, is it called a systematic review of systematic reviews? You explained just now about the shortened dental art or some such yes. article published? I'm sure they call it systematic review of systematic reviews, but you know, if you call something a systematic review, it must follow the guidelines of a systematic review. Okay. When I did a overview of systematic reviews, I, it, was a, it was a similar methodology because your searches, your research question is the same, your searches are the same, you develop a search strategy for it, your, your searches are the same, you also have but you must have a certain number of databases. So for example, if you, if you write, um, if you're going to look at an overview of systematic reviews, you need to have at least four different databases. You need to at least minimum use four different databases mm -hmm. to search for appropriate literature. Um, so yes, they do. So I'd be careful. Those are like one of those where I would say, um, check what kind of systematic review it is, because everybody wants to do a systematic review, um, but they are they following the steps critically for a systematic review. Mm -hmm. So be careful when you do read those. Um, because it says it's a systematic review, can you trust the information coming out of there? Nobody wants to um, downplay or downgrade anybody else's research, but unfortunately there are people who are haphazard about those things. So make sure it has all the features in it before you accept those outcomes. Um, so yes, of course, that's important. Yeah. And- uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Surgery first, orthognatic approach versus conventional orthognatic approach, systematic review of systematic review. Yeah. I think it is. 
It is the yeah, same. That, that, yes, the same the comment same. that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Though we have, um, for doing reviews, can we conduct surveys and based on that combine the results with earlier published results? It depends what kind of review you want to do. Like I said, a survey is, for example, a cross-sectional study. If you're going to do a review, you want, you want to maybe include all mixed designs, then of course you can. Yes, of course you do register systematic reviews before you conduct them. Um, you register them with, you can register them with Prospero. You can register them with the Cochrane database if you want to do a Cochrane systematic review. Um, I did write my email address. Um, yes, please. Yeah, Somebody asked I, did, I did, yeah. Because your last slide was disappeared very soon. Yeah, no, that's fine. They are rotated there twice already. Thank um, you. So you have to register those systematic reviews. And Prospero, fol Prospero follows a set pattern for, and in Co even Cochrane, the Cochrane database, you register your title first so mm -hmm. that they can check to see nobody else is doing that. So if you've registered your title, it's registered. And if somebody else then comes to register your, the same title, they will refuse it. They will say someone else has registered the title already. And even if it's similar, they won't take it. They won't accept it. Yes, you have to register your protocols, for, especially for systematic reviews, because when you publish your paper, the journal also wants to know whether you've registered your, 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 your um, systematic review. Now, remember, systematic reviews do not have to be registered at institutional level because it is not you don't have to register it for ethics because you're not working with people. You're looking at articles. So a systematic review would um, not really be registered. So you don't have to necessarily register it, but you can register it if you want to. Um, you can register it on the specific databases that's available. So you can register it on Prospero, I said, you can register it at the Cochrane database, wherever, wherever you're going to conduct it. So, um, so when you publish it, when you publish it, you can then say, you know, you've registered it with I've also discovered, because I was looking at the protocols, for example, you can publish that as well. And institutionally, we also have a site at our university where you can publish your protocol. It can have access to people and they can comment on it. But there are um, sites where you can publish it worldwide as well. The the, the name of the site has is, is, is just gone out of my mind now, but I've discovered the site when I was looking at where I can publish a protocol, I've now submitted a protocol for a systematic review where you publish the protocol as well. So instead of just getting one publication out of a systematic review, you might get two. So you can do that as well. Um, uh, what was Somebody asked, would you please write the um, address of systematic Hello? review, but you, you explained yes. that you have forgotten, unfortunately, the name of the yeah. the address and the address of the Cochrane site. database. No, yeah, these Cochrane. are the two sites. Okay. These are the two sites where you can register a systematic review. Um, okay. You start with the title and Prospero. You have to have your protocol in place in order to do it to register it. Um, but there are other sites as well. Maybe I can share that with you at a later stage, Dr. Fariba, and you can share it with a group if they're interested or maybe i'll put it on the whatsapp group if i find it yes, yes because but you do that. Yeah. yeah so any other questions related we've done the research question we've done clinical questions we've done the formats we spoke a bit about reviews um any other questions i can answer i'm i'm at your service for now still i don't uh, know to what time are you really, going the, the topic is difficult if I yes. want to have some question, I should uh, hear you. Your, your uh, I hear your voice again and again yes. to yes. understand it properly. Yes. And ask, then ask my question. No, of course, of course, it is. Um, the topic is not. It's not easy. No, not at and all. And once you've done it a few times, it's easier to speak sometimes about it. But once you've actually done it, it's it it shows you different things. And you know, 
this this topic of systematic reviews and research questions they evolve all the time they evolve all the time and um they there are so many changes that 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 um that you have to be aware of so i can tell you something today but in the, in the next year there might be other changes yes um i'm i'm busy doing scoping reviews and yesterday i discovered oh my word you can critically appraise a scoping review and yet the initial aspects of a scoping review they said you don't have to critically appraise it so you know there are different different opinions as well yeah exactly uh, professor khan um, before There's a question. I the question question uh, several uh -huh. uh, audience asked for your email address would you please i write did i typed it twice i typed it twice in your chat so okay. if they go up on the chat they'll see it there uh but i didn't see it would you please repeat again and okay. then we go to the last question that is now is written thank you i appreciate it no problem no problem thank you um not the five sorry oopsie i don't know where the five <laughs> came from uwc.ac.za is khan at uwc.ac.za there we go um so yes of course is it right that when you haven't written on a subject you can't do a systematic review on such a topic or subject i'm not so sure what that is i don't know where that comes from no 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 nobody says you can't <laughs> nobody says you can't you can choose you know i and 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 we say this and covid has actually pushed us to this level um we we had to say to students you can't do um primary research because you can't you can't um you can't see patients now so the best way to do even for your masters is go do a systematic review or go do a different kind of review i will i offer different reviews because i know the different reviews not everybody um goes it's not everybody's interest um so yes you can do a systematic review so it became an alternative for people to actually do a systematic review instead of primary research and let me tell you it is no easy thing to do it takes you more than a year to do it is it can solidly be a systematic review for a masters degree so you can do a systematic review as, as a, for your masters and no you did not have to have been able to write on the subject matter before you can find any area of interest and say okay you know what i've looked at this and there's so much primary research here but there's no systematic reviews on it i've had a student of mine and um, one of somebody that that commented earlier on um sounded almost like a but i've had a student where she had to do we were we busy with uh, research as on implants and she then searched for systematic reviews on implants and she found lots of systematic reviews on implants and um so you know there are there's subject matter out there you just need to search for it and see what there is and if there isn't then you allowed to go and do that systematic review nobody can stop you from doing it okay thank you any other questions uh the last question is that your email address is still is not visible and i cannot see it as well oh, okay it's, it's oh it's privately it says privately yeah. every time you, you told that several times in chat but we could not see it uh, no, i have no idea i'm i'm typing it into someone else's word yeah, into someone else's okay i tell you what we do let yeah. me go to chat yeah and but it it's it's again someone else's name send to the chat in the chat send to everyone in the meeting okay i think that's what it is it goes to someone else i don't know where that changed that was in me that's uh, why they keep asking can yeah, everyone that for everyone thank you just now it is it is yeah. observed everybody everybody can see it and i can see it as well thank you <laughs> it, 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 it was not me it was <laughs> anyway that's okay now there we are yeah two days uh, many of our audience um are students so uh are they students okay and the topic you present is really difficult even for me and even for many many faculty members so i'm i'm still learning don't worry i'm still <laughs> learning 
And it's still, I need to, as I told you, read it several and hear it several times in order to know and understand it properly. And uh, they, uh, somebody asked that whether this, uh, uh, this presentation is recorded or not. Yes, it would be available in the website. Uh, you can uh, have an access to it later after it is prepared uh, and listen it several times. Uh, any sessions is recorded as also it depends on the allowance of the lecture that whether it is allowed to be recorded or not. But as far as I know, uh, all the lectures are recorded. You may share it with me. Lecture. You can share it with me. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I will do it. I yeah. will do it. Professor uh, Khami, please. Any Let's other questions? Yeah. Which website? They're asking you which website is it on? Uh, that uh, in the booklet, the website of Tehran University in the International Affairs uh, has been addressed and the audience and the participant can refer to and have an access to it. Professor Khami, if you have any, any advice about this issue and this question the participant don't have, would you please explain about it? Yes, the address has been written here, Tehran University of Medical Science. You can see it, save it, uh, refer to it, and you can have an access to the recording of the lecture of all our lectures. Is there any question that uh, participant and audience have? And before finishing uh, today's session, uh, we can- okay, may, I just, may I just add a comment, Dr. Mutarras sure. Yes, please, I hear you. Yes, okay. Um, once again, thank you. I want to thank uh, also Professor Khan for the nice lecture and um, uh, how, how uh, she could cover this important topic. Uh, and. Uh, as we can now um, see the feedbacks, so many of the participants, um, they, they, are, they are saying that it was a great lecture. Um, but just I want to say to those who might be, because as uh, Professor Khan nicely said that uh, we don't know about the knowledge levels of our participants, and we have many participants, so and they are, certainly they are not at, at the same level. Mm -hmm. So for those who, who might uh, ha have some more questions or maybe uh, need some more information to uh, completely understand the lecture by Professor Khan. I just want to say that, as I told uh, in the uh, first session, that we have a spiral met, um, design for our course. So uh, we will go deeply to these, uh, for example, um, critical appraisal of uh, systematic reviews and, and randomized control trials in our uh, next session sessions. And also we have a session um, completely devoted to databases, how to search databases. So I, want, I, I just want to say that they, they will, they will uh, have more insight in our next uh, sessions regarding the topics that they might think that at present, um, they are somehow confused with that. Um, but they think that I, I think today, um, the topic, uh, the, uh, how to define a clear question was nicely covered and presented by Professor Khan. Um, and again, we have time if you have any question, not to, in sure. this session, but if you have any question, you send uh, your question in that uh, WhatsApp group, or um, you can also email, send emails to us, to me, to, to Dr. Motavasselian. And we are also in connections with the old lecture, lecturers, including Professor Khan. So we can mm -hmm. have uh, some discussions with them and provide the answers to your, uh, your questions. Sure. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So that was my comments regarding the course. Thank, thank you. you. Professor Khan, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm I so glad. I just, I just want to echo what Dr. Kami Khami was saying, that they must stick with the other presentations as well. That's coming for the next few days. You can't do the one without the other. You've got to attend all the presentations because as you could see from those five A's, they all form part of a package. So my advice to, to the participants is please attend, attend those sessions, they are most important. Um, your other questions will then be answered as well, like the databases, the searches, as well as the critical appraisal. And you know, it's very difficult to explain critical appraisal. So sit through these presentations. It's a good guide for you. So that's my advice to them, please attend. 
um, please attend. It's, it's, it's wonderful um, to learn about this thing. And it's a beautiful world to be in, in terms of research. Thank you. For and thank you for the opportunity, everybody. And thank you for all the kind words, even in your chats. I'm looking at them. So thank you, people. Thank you, everybody. Thank we are thankful to you to uh, share your uh, the knowledge of you have your your absolute great knowledge you have with us about the, uh, the systematic review the final good question in Pico. I hope we can have uh, in near future another session with you about systematic review how we can do it the critical appraisal any topics you have exp you are yes. expert in it would be our honor thank you for the time you take us you're most welcome. Thank I you. see somebody has asked for a copy of, if you want me to, I can send you a PDF of the presentation. If, if you, you allow share. us, yes, yes, if you allow us, you can share it. We can, we sure. can uh, provide an access uh, for the audience to see and have an access to the PDF, the, the PowerPoint you kind of prepared. You're welcome. I will do Thank so. You. Thank you. All Take audience, care. Thank you bye -bye. for participating. You. Best wishes for you and bye bye. Thanks, Thanks so sorry. much. Bye. Sorry, sorry. bye before, before saying goodbye, before saying goodbye, <laughs> goodbye, just I, I want to say that we can have a group photo as as we had in the first session. Oh, okay, know. sure, great. Yes. So uh, please, if all the participants, uh, those who are uh, willing, uh, please just uh, turn on your cameras and then we can have the group photo. Sure. Are they turning it on? Yes, yes, they are turning. Oh. So, uh, so my colleagues, please tell me if it has been completed. So, we are waiting for the audience to start their video. Oh, yes. Okay, okay, okay. And please share such a photo with me, please. Send it to me. <laughs> sure, sure. sure. So if you're ready, uh, we're going to have to take a picture. Yes. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for all. Thank you okay. all. Bye-bye. time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, okay. See you for the next week on Wednesday at 2 p.m. at local time of Tehran. And it, you should change it to local time of your area that you reside in. Best wishes for all. Bye-bye. Professor Khan, bye. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, Fariba. Bye-bye, dear. Thank you.